Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21. We're going to read verses 1 through 13, a kind of lengthy portion of Scripture, but my message is entitled, Who is this? Who is this? Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 13. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. On this Palm Sunday, this message is a Palm Sunday message for you folks who will be watching on television and on YouTube. Who is this? Beginning with verse number 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, this is Jesus and his apostles, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, that is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Nice saddle, huh? And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches or palm uh, branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, or Hosanna is the Hebrew word, to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? That's where my title comes from. And Jesus went unto the temple of God and cast out all them and sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, beloved, I told you this morning that if you read Isaiah 56, 7, Isaiah 56, 1 through, 1 through 8, is really a messianic prophecy. Jesus is quoting from that right now. My house, his house right here, his church house, amen? Or uh, episynagoge is the Greek word, or ekklesia, but that's where we get synagogue epi, uh, in, in Hebrews 10.25 when it says, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. That word is epi, uh, uh, episynagoge. <laughs> we, we gotta start, we gotta make sure we keep synagoguing together. In other words, it's the church. All righty. Who is this? Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence on this Palm Sunday and we praise you, Lord God. We say, Hosanna, Lord God. We lift you up. We magnify you, O God, as our creator, as our redeemer. And Lord, blessed be God as our soon coming king. Father, I pray that you'd anoint this message. Open the hearts of thy people. Give this preacher a spiritual anointing. Give me physical strength, Lord God, that I can convey the word of God. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Historically, the church has called this portion of Scripture Christ's triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. Now, beloved, this is when Christ revealed himself to them, the city of Jerusalem, as the king of the Jews. Now, John the Baptist had already done that in the Jordan River, but now he's coming right into the very heart of Judaism, which was the city of Jerusalem. Now, this marks the beginning of the last week of Christ's life here on earth. At first, the early church called these seven days the Passover. Later, it was changed to Holy Week. And then ultimately to Passion of the Christ, just like in Mel Gibson's movie that we've seen. Now, the exact day of Christ's entry is called Palm Sunday because of the palm branches that the people were waving and also they were spreading <clears throat> excuse me, in Christ's path as they hailed him as their long-awaited coming messianic king. Whew, they said, he's finally come. He's finally arrived. You know, Christ foreknew all of the pain and suffering that awaited them there. And Christ foreknew that these people were fickle people. That's why he didn't want to commit himself to him, because he knew it was a man's heart. But I'll tell you what, in his infinite love, he still said, I'm going to go there, I'm going to go to the cross, I am going to go to Calvary, I am going to atone for their sins, I will redeem them. We thank God for his infinite love, amen, as he died as our sacrifice, our substitute, and our sin bearer. So there, beloved, on that giblet of shame, he made an atonement. 
And he bore the curse and condemnation of the law in our place. Why? To save us from the burning, boiling, bubbling fires of hell. And beloved, that's not just me throwing adjectives out there. That's what the scripture literally teaches. Hell is real. Jesus would have never came. Jesus would have never died. And when people break his law casually, think nothing of it. And by the way, the gospel is the power to obey the law of God. The law is the will of God. The gospel is the power to obey it. And so it's no light thing to do that. But anyways, these seven historic days, beloved, were days that radically changed the world forever. And no one, I mean no one, but a divine heavenly being like Christ has ever made such a huge impact on this world. So much so that our calendars are calibrated after his death. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, as we study the Gospels, and I've done this before, but I had to do it, but collectively they give us a divine itinerary of Christ, what he did during this last week of his life. And I'm just going to briefly tell you quickly. On Sunday, the first day of the week, Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem amidst the shouts of Hosanna to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 as we're reading right here. On Monday, the second day of the week, Jesus walked into the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changes, the corrupt money changes. On Tuesday, the third day of Holy Week, Jesus taught the people in the, te in the temple in parables. And the reason for that, a parable is an earthly story that conveys a heavenly truth. And if you're really interested, you'll start meditating on it and pondering it to see what it means. Amen? But anyways, beloved, not only did he do that, but what he also did on that day is he talked about the hypocritical and heretical teachings of the Pharisees and he also predicted that this city of Jerusalem, this temple that you see right now, will be utterly destroyed in 70 AD, which it was by the Roman legions under General Titus. Amen? On Wednesday, the fourth day of the week, beloved, the gospel writers are silent. No one really knows what Jesus did on that Wednesday. But let me tell you what scholars think and what theologians think. They believe that Jesus and his disciples rested in Bethany that day in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. In other words, he took a little R&R on &R that day. On uh, uh, Monday, Thursday, that's what they call it today, Monday, Thursday, the fifth day of the, uh, Holy Week, Jesus celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room where he instituted the new covenant which he said would be established for many by his shed blood on the cross, beloved. And that's how he was going to redeem mankind. Would you say amen out there? He says, my blood is being shed for the remission, the forgiveness of their sins. There is no forgiveness of sin without the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless, crimson blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on and say amen out there. On Good Friday, the sixth day of the week, Jesus was arrested. He was tried. He was beaten. He was condemned to death. He was crucified on Calvary's cross, or what we know is called uh, Golgotha, the place of the skull. Then, beloved, on Saturday of Holy Week, the seventh day of the week, what did Jesus do? He rested on the seventh day of the week. Now listen to me, according to the commandment. Now why did Jesus do that? At the end of creation week, God rested. Amen. Jesus rested. He did the same thing on the seventh day of the week on Redemption Week. Why? Because if he got up and started working, he'd have broken the law and he couldn't redeem us. He'd been a lawbreaker. So he kept the law even in his death. But then we come to sunset Saturday night uh, when the first day of the week began to dawn, beloved, and Jesus on the dark side resurrected. In other words, what we would know is tonight when it gets dark, that's when Jesus really resurrected, even though they didn't go to the tomb until Sunday morning. But Jesus miraculously resurrected from the dead and conquered sin, Satan, death, hell, the grave, and this evil world system, and immediately he went back to work on his redemptive missions, seeking and saving us, beloved, who were lost. I said who were lost. That'd be you and me, amen? Because all men are lost through Christ gets a hold of them. So, beloved, then the resurrected Christ appeared to his disciples so that both he and they could and would confirm his resurrection as his eyewitnesses. First he appeared to Mary Magdalene, and then to Peter, and then to James, his brother, and then to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. Then he appeared to the eleven chicken-livered 
apostles who fled for their lives are now gathered in the locked room on Sunday, the Bible says, for fear of the Jews, and he had to upbraid them for their unbelief. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying on that Sunday, the apostles weren't gathered together there for a worship service. They were gathered together for a worry service. Why? Because they feared, here's our Messiah, our Lord, he's been crucified. They're going to hunt us down and do the same thing. Now, a lot of Christians try to, uh, they, they go to John chapter 20, verse 9, and they try to say, well, you know, there was a worship service. But I would just read the context, would you? He says they were there for fear of the Jews, not because they were having a worship. They didn't even believe in the resurrection yet. That's why Jesus, the Bible said, had to upbraid them for their unbelief. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, when Jesus began his ministry and emerged on the public scene, he was hailed by everyone as an overnight sensation. I mean, he was known as a hero. He was the healer. People saw him as the miracle worker from Nazareth. Now, beloved, that would have shocked the Jew because Nazareth was a little down and out kibbutz and nothing good ever came from Nazareth. That's what Philip said, remember? And yet here's this great miracle worker walking the countryside, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons. Sometimes I get it backwards. I said, he's casting out the bread and healing the, uh, the, uh, the loaves. <laughs> but all that to say, <clears throat> excuse me, beloved, is this, that multitudes followed him at that time wherever he went. Great came, crowds came just to see him. Great crowds came to just to get a glimpse of him, beloved, and they wanted to hear him speak. Because he spoke as one that had authority. He spoke with the doctrine that had authority, not like the scribes, not like the Pharisees. And the people knew they could go to the scriptures and search it out to see whether or not what he said was true. Amen? Now, for three years, Jesus was at the very height of his popularity. A great uh, wave of messianic fervor and messianic fever swept the countryside and the city at this time. But now, but over the last six months, because Jesus had started teaching some real hard sayings about how to be saved, and people have a tendency to overlook that and just stress the love of God, and they overlooked everything that Jesus had to say, amen? But it was because of the hard sayings of Jesus that these Jews who ipso facto thought they were saved because they were Jewish, they were sons of Abraham, they had been circumcised, that automatically that they were citizens of the kingdom of God, and Jesus told them not so. And I preached to you that a while ago. But anyways, this zealous religious expectation of who this Jesus was really began to wane. Is he really the Messiah? Is he a fraud? Is he an imposter? Who is he? Is he John the Baptist resurrected again or one of the prophets? Who is this Jesus? So, beloved, the crowds began to shrink and his critics now publicly attacked him because he did not measure up to their messianic hopes. So now we come to the very last week of Christ's life. And, beloved, Palm Sunday challenges us to be drawn into the crescendo of this divine drama of Holy Week and follow Jesus as he enters into the city of Jerusalem with great fanfare and the confused people curiously asked, who is this? Who is this Jesus? Who really is he? We want to know. So there's six things I want to show you about this. The first thing I want you to see is the king's command. The king's command. I want you to look at verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to drop down to verses seven, uh, 6 and 7. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. Now I want you to drop down to verses 6 and 7. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and uh, put on, uh, on them their clothes, and they set him there. Now, beloved, I want you to notice this that Christ himself was in sovereign control of all of the events of Palm Sunday and Holy Week. His prescience foreknew his passion, so he had previously prearranged all this, like a conductor of a symphony, beloved. Our Lord Jesus Christ had orchestrated all the events of Holy, uh, Holy Week. In other words, like the rhythm of a catchy song, beloved, they marked time to the beat of his divine arrangement. 
as you saw in verses 4 and 5, I'm not going to have you read that again, just for brevity of time. But the voice of the prophets, here quoting Zechariah 9.9, foretold that Israel's messianic king of his entrance into the city of Jerusalem would be a bitter, sweet reception. In other words, they would be cheering him on Sunday, but they would be jeering him on Friday. In a matter of six short days, can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen? And here's this person, the least you could say, why would I jeer him? He's a miracle worker. Good night. I mean, he's helped so many people. Why would I ever want to do that? And yet they did because they were disillusioned and they were fickled people. But I want you to look at verse 1 again. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples. Now, beloved, here we see that Jews... Jesus uses men to fulfill his great plan of redemption. Now, it's important we understand that, beloved. And I'm sure that the two disciples that he sent were totally unaware that Jesus was using them to specifically do this, to work out the logistics and all of the precise particulars of God's redemptive plan. And this plan, the Bible says, was framed from the very foundation of the world. Before there was a tree, before there was a daffodil, before there was an earth, that plan was in place. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, Jesus used their obedience of faith to work out this great drama of redemption. Everyone, as you read the story, everyone that was involved obeyed to the letter what he commanded them to do. For example, they obeyed his command to go to the village of Bethany. They obeyed his command to find a female donkey in her little colt, tied up there, just waiting for them. They obeyed the command to tell the owners of these animals the Lord's precise words, that the Lord has need of them, so this person that owned them would know exactly who was asking from them, and he could let that donkey and that colt go. Would you say amen? They, ob they obeyed his command to bring all these animals, uh, uh, both of these animals, back to him, beloved. These were his preordained mouth, and they set him on top of that, beloved, where he entered the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as Israel's messianic king, just as prophecy had predicted. Now, beloved, what I'm trying to say to you is this. As this shows us how God works to fulfill his redemptive plan. He not only uses men, now listen to me, but also needs them. He needs us to do it for his glory. Would you say amen? In other words, beloved, we're his servants. We're his hands. We're his arms. We're his legs. We're his mouthpiece. He works through us. Ephesians 5.30 says we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, oh, how important it is for us. Us right here today, those watching my television, those on YouTube, to obey the commands of Christ, to fulfill God's redemptive plan. And that's why he supernaturally imparts spiritual gifts and graces to us, beloved, to fulfill his call in our lives so we can help him complete this redemptive plan that the triune God founded from the foundation of the world. Would you say amen? What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this, that we need to obey God, especially when he has an important job for us to do for him. I can't tell you how many times God has called me to go see someone, confront someone, talk to someone, get in the middle of someone, and I hate confrontations, and I know you do, but I say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. I'm listening, and I'll go do it. And sometimes it's, it, it can be a weighty thing in your life. Amen? But hear me now. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 15, verse 22, the Bible says, Behold... To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of lambs. You know, Samuel said that to King Solomon. Um, excuse me, King Saul. King Saul all, uh, lost his whole kingdom because he refused to obey God's commandments. And God had said, Saul, if you obey me, I will establish your kingdom forever. And people have, uh, when, they, when they see the word forever, they say, see, see, forever. Well, the word forever is used five different ways in the Bible, but I don't have time to go there right now. But of course, we know that King Saul, his kingdom did not last forever. King David ultimately took over the kingdom because he was a man after God's own heart. Amen? But you listen to me, beloved. There's a lot of impenitent backsliders 
who are not going to enter the kingdom of God because they refuse, they refuse to obey God. I know what you say. That's when I was talking to you about the law. Can you imagine, beloved, twice in the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation 15, 5. The Bible says when Jesus comes back, he opens the Ark of the Covenant and he judges men. And what do you think's inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of his testimony. It's the Ten Commandments. Sin is the transgression of God's law. But people think nothing of it today because they've been taught wrong. You see, beloved, Christ alone Christ alone is the commander-in-chief of the Lord's army, not us. So when he says jump, we need to comply and say, how high, Lord? How high do you want me to? That's what they taught me in Paris. <laughs> when Drew instructor said jump, you said, yes, sir, how high? <laughs> so, beloved, he's the king and we're but the subjects, amen? The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, that God gives the Holy Spirit to them who obey him, not to those who disobey him, if you want a real anointing on you, then you need to submit and surrender your heart to God and let him anoint you with his Holy Spirit. Amen. So the events of Palm Sunday show us, beloved, how vitally important it is for us disciples of Christ to obey him. He calls and commands us to preach and proclaim the gospel so men can be saved. He calls and commands us to evangelize and rescue the lost souls. He's working in us, with us, through us. He calls and commands us, ladies and gentlemen, to evangelize, to advance the kingdom of God on this earth, to fulfill God's redemptive plan for man. And so God's always working through his church, through his saints, through his people. Amen. Every Christian, what did I say? Every Christian is a proverbial cog in the wheel of God's redemption. Every Christian has been given spiritual gifts, talents, Abilities to enable them to perform a specific job and a specific task God has called them to do. Every Christian has a part to play in this divine drama of God's redemption for, uh, uh, for man. So, beloved, who is this that commands and demands such unwavering obedience from his followers? Who is this that requires such staunch loyalty from his workers? Who is this? that calls his disciples to do such lofty things to help him fulfill God's redemptive plan for man? Who is this that has such divine authority to be able to require such things from men? Well, beloved, I'll tell you this. It's no ordinary man. It's an extraordinary man, an alien being from out of this world and universe, from a far-off distant place and planet from somewhere up yonder. Amen? We call it the third heaven. But that's who tiptoed across the Milky Ways and came down here and took on human flesh. So who is this? Why, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So who is this? It's God's eternal Son and God's eternal Savior. So who is this? It's our Messiah. It's our Master, beloved. So who is this? Why, it's our sovereign King and Commander of God's army, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of heaven's celestial angelic armies. That's who he is. Well, you listen, beloved. Listen closely because Jesus still comes to us individually as people. Amen? And so this may be your Palm Sunday. This may be the day he's coming to you. As here, beloved, when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem and comes to us, what will you do when he comes to you? Will you accept him or reject him? Will you obey him or disobey him? What will you do when he comes to you Will you worship him or will you whip him like the Romans ended up doing? Under the auspices of what the religious leaders and the people wanted done, crucify him, crucify him. What will you do when Jesus comes to you? Beloved, will you worshipfully wave your hands up in the air and praise to him or will you shake your fist in the nostrils of a holy God in defiance of him, beloved? So who is this? On the point number one, I'll tell you who it is, beloved. It's our king and our commander. Would you say amen? Number two, the king's coming. The king's coming. I want you to look at verses 4 and 5a. It says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. So I want to stop you right there. Now, Beloved, 
Nothing could ever stop the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I can assure you, he came as a, as a lamb for slaughter, amen, to redeem us. And I can assure you there's nothing that's ever going to stop his second coming when he comes as a roaring lion from the tribe of Judah to judge the world. Jesus is not coming back to save anybody. He's coming back to rescue his saints. He's coming back to condemn those who rejected him. He's coming back as the divine judge. Imagine if it were to happen today how many souls are lost. And so, beloved, he's fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, as I told you. So these frenzied people, beloved, had messianic fervor and fever. And, beloved, they didn't know what to expect because they had been wrongly taught of what the Messiah was or who the Messiah was. You see, they had been taught that there was two different Messiahs. And I've taught you this before, so I'm just going to gloss over it. They taught, number one, that there was Mashiach Israel ben David. Messiah Israel ben David. And he was going to be a warrior king, a deliverer, to liberate them from the tyranny of the Gentile Roman oppressors and then establish a Jewish aristocracy and political kingdom on this earth as in the days of King David with Israel at the head of all of the nations. Beloved, this was the erroneous Zionist dream then and it's the erroneous dispensational dream today that they've resurrected. They just took what was wrong from the Old Testament and they put it into the New Testament and sadly most Christians believe that because it's all they've been taught. That was a Zionist dream. Christ never came to set up a political kingdom, a spiritual kingdom and an eternal kingdom at the second advent. Come on and say amen out there. And so, beloved, they were looking for Mashiach Israel, uh, Israel ben David. Number two, they were looking for Mashiach Israel ben Yosef. Messiah Israel ben Joseph. He was to be a priestly king who'd come to restore the Jewish religion. He'd remit their sins. He'd restore Israel back to God. But beloved, when Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem, listen to me, they were wrong. He never, ever raised an army. He never created a rebellion. He never overthrew or ousted the uh, Romans, beloved, or drove them out of Israel. He never did what the people expected. Jesus always did what the people did not expect in their life, what they least expected. Amen? But you listen to me. Jesus alone, Jesus only, he's the one and only true Messiah who fulfilled Messiah Israel ben Yosef at the first advent. Jesus came as our priestly king. At the second advent, he will yet fulfill Messiah Israel ben David when he comes as the warrior king. Amen. Revelation chapter 19. You can read that. Come on and say amen out there. When he comes back to judge the world. The question is, have you let Jesus personally come to you? To come to your soul? To come to you as your Lord, as your Savior, as your King, beloved? If you haven't, you need to do it. Don't put it off. God never promises you tomorrow. So who is this Jesus anyway? Oh, beloved, listen to me. I, I, I could have gone on and on with this one because I, I had a spell when I was putting this together. Of course, it's not unusual for me to have spells anyway. <laughs> I was crazy once. But beloved, he's the one who says that God had sent him into this world. In John 3, 16, believe it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's the one that says in Matthew 28, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 28, 30. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Would you say amen? He's the one, beloved, that says in John 14, 27, he says, My peace, I live with you, leave with you. And my peace, he says, I give to you. He's the one who says in John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's the one that said in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Would you say amen? Beloved, he's the one that says in John 10, 10, I am come that you may have life and that more abundantly. He's the one that says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee and I will never forsake thee. You might do that to me, but I won't do it to you. Come on and say amen out there. And beloved, he's the one that says in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world or the age. 
And he's the one that says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Would you say amen? And beloved, blessed be God. He's the one that says in Revelation 21, 5, Behold, I make all things new. Amen. So question is, have you let this king come unto you, beloved, and make all things new in you? Listen to me now. Like a new heart, like a new mind, like a new soul, like a new spirit, like a new life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Come on and say hallelujah. In fact, I'm probably the only one with this right in here today. <laughs> you haven't got any. I'm going to wave my palm for that. Hallelujah. Hosanna. Hosanna. So, beloved, the question is this here. Who is this man to you? You personally. And how do you react when he constantly and continu continually comes to you, beloved? When he comes to you as king. Then he says, I want to be the Lord over your life. I want to be the king over your life. I own you. You're my property. You don't own yourself. I can't tell you, beloved, especially in the last few weeks, I had to say, Lord, let this cup pass me by. Your will be done, not mine. Let thy will be done, not mine. So, beloved, what are we seeing? We've seen the king's command. We've seen the king's coming. Thirdly, the king's condescension. Condescension. I didn't say cond condensation. Condescension. You humble yourself. Look what he says in verse 5b. When he comes, he says he's meek and sitting upon an ass. And then he says, a colt, the foal of an ass. Now the word meek, praus, that means that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday in a humble and a meek and a gentle, lowly manner as their king. And he did not do it as a proud, haughty, conquering king like all other conquered kings did at that time. Scripture teaches this, beloved, that the incarnation, and I don't have time to go into this doctrine, it's called the doctrine of the kenosis, the doctrine of the self-emptying of Christ, when he temporarily set aside what we call his non-communicable attributes. For example, like his omnipotence, omniscience, his omnipresence, his communicable attributes, he shares with us his love, his grace, his mercy, but he doesn't give us omnipotence or omniscience or omnipresence. Amen? Those are called the non-communicable attributes. Say that. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> you know, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul, thinking about this, he had a spell. In fact, this was, in the early church, this was a baptismal hymn. They sang this when they would baptize people in the spring. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul says this. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Would you say amen? What are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying it speaks of his condescension. It speaks of his voluntary descent and humbling of himself from his infinitely high rank and position in heaven to the lowest and meekest man that ever walked on the top side of this earth. You see, beloved, he condescended from imagine being the creator of the universe to being born in a crib. He condescended from being the blessed one to the babe in Bethlehem and he was born from poor parents and he was born in a stable. How much more can you humble yourself he condescended between this, being the sovereign ruler of the universe that threw the galaxies into space to cause all stars by their name, becoming our sacrifice and our redeemer. Hey, beloved, what I'm saying to us, or what I'm saying to you is this. Here's Jesus, he who was the eternal son of the living God. Here's Jesus, he who is the king of the universe. 
Here's Jesus. He was the King of kings and Lord of lords. Here's Jesus who was divine royalty personified. Here's Jesus who was the Lord and Savior of the world riding into the city of Jerusalem as their king. Not on a big white stallion. Not on some huge Clydesdale horse. Not on some prancing steed like a proud conqueror on a uh, would do. But instead, beloved, as they look at him, he's on a little innocent donkey's colt. A donkey's colt who's never been dirtied before, who's never been defiled before, who's never worked, been worked before or ridden before. Why, beloved? Because it was denoting by looking at that donkey, the carrier that he was carrying, the character of that carrier, that, car- uh, that person he carried. He was looking at someone who was absolutely humble and innocent, just like that little colt. That's why he did it. Not prancing like the kings would do. He comes in on a little colt. You know, I thought about that. That donkey's colt had never been burdened before, but he had the distinct and exclusive privilege of carrying him who was our burden barrier, amen, who'd come to save and sanctify us. You know, the Bible says this of Jesus in Hebrews 7, 26, that he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and he's made higher than the heavens. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, my finite mind can't even grasp that sometimes when I think about it. And the Bible says, beloved, in Philippians 2, way that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. It says, even unto the death of the cross. And then Paul said to the church at Corinth in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he said, God had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You have no righteousness of your own, but in Jesus you are righteous. Would you say Amen. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this divine and humble king will not force himself on us. He won't force himself on you to be your Lord, your Savior, your king. But he offers us an invitation and a choice. We have to make it. And that's why he says in 11, uh, Matthew 11, 20, uh, uh, 8 through 30, and I won't quote it again, but he says, Come unto me, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. Come unto me, not Moses. Come unto me, not Mohammed. Come unto me, not the Pope. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I, and I will give you rest. Well, you say, well, Pastor Joel, did he come riding to us? I'll tell you, beloved. He comes to us riding on the Holy Spirit. He comes to us riding on his gospel. And bless God, he comes riding on his infinite love to us. Would you say amen? Not to mention his mercy. Not to mention his grace. That he comes riding on it to each and every one of us. But the question is, beloved, will you accept or reject him as your Messiah? Will you accept him or reject him as your master? None of us like to have a master over us. We want to be the master of our own destiny, the master of our own life. Well, I've learned a long time ago, not only as a Christian, but especially as a pastor, what is it you want me to do, Lord? And believe me when I tell you that, Lord, what is it you want me to do, Lord, I ask him. (laughs) Sometimes I wish I didn't. But I said, what is it you want me to do, Lord? Will you accept them as your monarch? You know, James 4.4 says this. James, he's the half-brother of Jesus. He says that God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. You be proud and high. Go ahead. God says, I'll resist you. It's like, you know, when a father puts his hand on his little son's head and the kid's swinging away and flailing away and he can't reach his father. God says, I resist the proud, so don't want to be proud, amen? And so, beloved, he comes to you, and he brings forgiveness, but do you want it? And he comes to you, and he brings salvation and eternal life, but do you want it? And he comes to you, and he brings peace, and he brings love and joy and reconciliation with God, so you can never, forever live with him in the eternal kingdom of God. But the question is, do you want it? I do. Fourthly, beloved, I want you to see the kinetic crowd. That's K-I-N-E-T-I-C if you are taking notes. That word kinetic means excited, frenzied, energetic, 
Look what he says in verses 8 and 9. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So here, here's Jesus, beloved, their holy and humble king, coming to them on this Palm Sunday the way the people least expected it. His mount was a donkey's colt. Can you imagine that? This is our king, and he's riding on a little donkey that's never been worked. His saddle was the dirty clothes of his disciples. They just threw him on there. Sit on that, Jesus. His entourage were common folks who followed him, beloved. Not dignitaries, not celebrities, not very important leaders and captives in bonds trailing behind him as the conquering kings would do after a battle. They take their captives and they trail along in a little retinue after them, kind of shuffling in their chains. No, beloved, the road he traveled. Ultimately, that road was the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. It was filled with crowds and throngs of excited people waving their palms, palm branches, and loudly cheered and hailed and honored him as the Messiah and him as the king. And they hailed him as the hero. And they hailed him, listen to me now, as the expected liberator and deliverer from Rome. And these people shouted four distinct things that we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen. They shouted and cried out, number one, Hosanna, or Hosanna, meaning we give you glory, praise, and honor as our King, as our Savior, who's come to save us right now from our Roman bondage, from our Roman oppressors. But they never saw him, never even thought of him as being their deliverer from sin. Secondly, beloved, not only Hosanna, but his airship. They said, we see you as being the son of David, Israel's great warrior king. And what's amazing to me, beloved, is they looked at him as David's warrior. They had never seen in the past Jesus ever lift his hand to anybody. What would ever give them that impression? Only being taught wrong. Would you say amen out there? So you see, beloved, they thought, you know, he'd be just like King David. He'd deliver them from there and defeat the Gentile enemies. Number three, beloved, his honor. That is, who's now come to conquer. And notice it says in your text, in the name of the Lord. Why is that important? Meaning this, beloved, that the great God of Israel, they thought, had sent him to miraculously defeat these despotic uh, pagans and ensure his victory over Israel. And if you're doing it in the name of the Lord, then surely that's a guaranteed victory. Amen? So we're doing it in the name of the Lord. Number four, Hosanna in the highest. Meaning, we give you the most highest and utmost honor and loyalty as our King, as our Lord, as our Savior, and not Caesar. Now, beloved, this is profound, what I'm saying to you right now. Not because I'm saying it. Because these were dangerous words by the cheering crowds with their own Roman overlords, beloved, who could have viewed this as sedition, as treason, as mutiny. And their Roman overlords could have sent their legions in and destroyed the people, killed the people, dispersed the people. But somehow they stayed back. Why? Because it was God who was in sovereign control of everything. Not the Jews, not the Romans, not any man and not anyone else. So can you imagine the Romans sitting there with their spears, their weapons? Isn't that mutiny? Isn't that true? We kill people for that. Ah, we let them slide. God put it into their heart. Amen. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, what I'm saying to you, God was fulfilling his redemptive plan. He wasn't trying to break the yoke of Roman bondage, but he was trying to reveal to the city of Jerusalem their rightful king. Yes, he is the one. Why don't you go to the scroll of uh, Zechariah and chapter 9 and verse 9 and look it up and see if he's fulfilling exactly what he said he was going to do. So, beloved, on that Palm Sunday, they cheered him. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, the son of David. And on Friday, 
Friday rolls around. Crucify him. Should I let Barabbas go with Jesus? Crucify him, Pilate. Uh, they said the Pilate. Crucify him. Why? What have they done? I see no wrong in this man. Crucify him. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes right now. How about you? And I wouldn't want to be in their shoes in the day of judgment. How about you? Right now they're goose-stepping in hell, but that isn't where they're going to spend eternity. They're going to be tossed into the lake of fire, which the Bible calls the second death. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. What will you do? Will you say, crucify him? Beloved, God asked the whole world, who is this that I've sent to you? What do you personally call him? What do you personally make him in your life? Who is this? And I told you, beloved, that's exactly why Jesus, knowing the fickle hearts of men, would never commit himself to any man because the Bible says he knew what was in their heart. They'd be a Judas. They'd betray him. Sure, we love you when you feed us uh, fish and loaves of bread. Sure, we love you when you heal us. Sure, we love you when you make miracles, but we hate what you're preaching. It scratches us right where we're at. You're a burr in our saddle. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. People miss the whole point of Palm Sunday, don't they? Number five, beloved. Oh boy, well, pressing close here. The kingly confusion. Look what it says in verses 10 and 11. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Now in verse 11, the words was moved, Syro, means to tremble. It means to shake and quake. It means to be agitated. It means to be uh, thrown into a spirit of fear and confusion, beloved. And as then, so now. People are still confused about who this Jesus is. And even though his church has been here for 2,000 years, and we have Bibles in every, uh, uh, used to be anyways, in every hospital, in every hotel room, and people have it at their house collecting dust. And they're still confused. Who is this Jesus? So the city of Jerusalem was fearful. They were confused over who he was. Why? Because if he was indeed this warrior king, then they knew they were going to be in a war with Rome probably within the next few days. But they were wrong, weren't they? You see, beloved, he was indeed their king, but the only war they really had was with themselves about whether or not they'd accept him or they'd reject him as their king and their lord and their savior. And folks are still confused. I mean, when you talk to people, some say that he's just a prophet, beloved. Oh, but he's much more than just a prophet, I'll tell you right now. And some say he's just a great moral teacher. How can he be a great moral teacher when he says he's the eternal son of the living God? He's either a liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? But he's much more than that. And some say he was just some great religious leader. But beloved, I tell you, he's much more than that. Who is this Jesus? He's the eternal son, I told you, of the living God. He's the three anthropos. You say, Pastor Joel, that's a pretty big word. Theon, God, Theos, Anthropos. We get anthropology from it. Man, the God-man. Fully God, fully man. Deity enshrined and shrouded and enfleshed in humanity. And beloved, the Bible says when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. People think that he was a beautiful, handsome guy with blue eyes or whatever. He was an ordinary looking guy just like myself. Most of us here today, except for Tom. The question is, beloved, how does King Jesus see you? How does he, King Jesus see you? Does he see you as a saint, a sinner? Does he see you saved? Does he see you lost, beloved, faithful, unfaithful? Which is it? How does he see you? And last me, let me close with this. The cleansing, the king's cleansing. The king's cleansing, look at verses 12 and 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house, my house, I own it. I'm the divine authority in it. My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. 
Well, Jesus cleansed the temple twice during his ministry, and this is the second time and the last time, by the way, beloved, that he did this. Overthrowing the money changers' tables. Because he says, my house is a place of purity, and it's a place of, of prayer. Now, beloved, it's not a den of moral and spiritual corruption. And I'm going somewhere with this, so listen closely. It's not a den of covetousness. It's not a den of carnality. You know, later, Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem, and he said this in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee together uh, uh, unto me as a hen gathereth your chicks under his rings, but ye would not. He says, For I say unto you, from henceforth ye shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus shouted it. The word uh, spoke there is the word caruso. He heralded it out. That's what it means. At the top of his lungs, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Imagine how he shook him up. I thought we already knew the Lord. Blessed is he. I am the blessed one that comes in the name of the Lord. And you need to say that. That's what he was saying to them. Hear me now, beloved. When we get saved, we, we become the temple of God. Amen. The Bible says we become the temple of the living God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, What know ye not that your body is a temple of the living God which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Who owns my body? God. Who owns my soul? God. Who owns my spirit? God. Do you let him do this, beloved? Do you let Jesus cleanse your temple? you let Jesus cast the sin out of your life? You know, he comes to overthrow the tables of our life, doesn't he? <laughs> he has a way of really making us uncomfortable when he gets involved until we bow the knee to King Jesus. And we reflect on all the things that are going on and all the things that are happening. And we say, Lord, I know that you're speaking to me. Speak, O Lord. Thy servant is listening. Just like Ananias said, God spoke to him to go speak to the Apostle Paul. Amen. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? Let me close with this. Palm Sunday. The people are going to celebrate tomorrow. Palm Sunday has never been about palms. But always about Jesus Christ entering the city of Jerusalem and entering our life as our King and as our Lord and Savior and as our Master. Who is this Jesus to you personally, beloved? Will you raise your palms up in praise to him? Or you've dropped your hands in protest of him. I'm going to raise one hand and one palm. Jesus is my Lord, my rock, my fortress, my shield, my buckler. How about you? Come on and say amen. All right, let's go to the throne of grace.